Good morning, First Christian Church. Ah, good to see everyone. Um, just, just to mention, we're coming up on our yearly yard sale here. This is going to be the first weekend in August. And uh, I noticed uh, they've got the bar up in Fellowship Hall for all the hanging clothes. We'd love for you to donate something for the yard sale. And you could chat with Jane, who's sitting over here to my left, if, uh, if you had a question. But I think, generally speaking, we're going to want you to bring items to the Fellowship Hall at this point. Is that correct, Jane? She says, maybe. Call the church office. Make sure you, you get a handle on that. But we... Right. Yeah. So, um, but it, we would still love for you to donate items. Um, yeah, yeah. Don't bring the 14-inch, 72-inch television. Um, those things are heavy. But uh, we'd love any, any donations, and we'd love for you to come and be a part of uh, our yard sale and make a donation. All the proceeds go to support our ministry of the church. Um, so keep that in mind as we're coming up here in these, uh, these weeks, final weeks of July. Good to see everyone this morning. Let's worship together. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made, we will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let's join together in our call to worship. O oh God, your word is a lamp to our feet. Each Sunday, we confirm our journey with you. Please accept our offerings of praise. Your guidance is our heritage forever. We incline ourselves to you during this time of worship, and we join together in our opening hymn, Surely the Presence of the Lord is in this place. in our unity prayer. Dear God, Savior God, help us understand with Mary and Martha how to live in the intricate balance between faith and works, being and doing, being nourished and serving others in all things present and all things to come. We trust your leading in all our ways through the spirit of Christ who dwells in us now and forevermore. Amen.
forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from I'm going to ask uh, Allie Ori and Macy Armistead to come up for a minute. We wanted to, um, last week you had a chance to commission these two to head off to camp. And we wanted to get a follow-up and find out how their week at church camp had been at Craig Healing Springs. We had a chance to speak a little bit with Macy during the early service. And she told us that she stayed in Oak Lodge. And... That was kind of interesting news to me because we had a team that went up there and did some work in Oak Lodge. And so it's kind of nice to know that we were able to kind of support some of the ministry happening at Craig Healing Springs. Macy, tell us about your experience there in Oak Lodge with your friends. Um, it was a good time to be at Craig Springs, and it was a good time in Oak Lodge. It's much different because it's not like a cabin. It's more like a hotel, and there's just two beds in a room with the sink, bedroom, or bathrooms, all, like, there's three in the halls. Um, I think there was a total of 12 girls, or 13, in there. Um, it was a lot of fun. We had a lounge room that we could hang out in later at night, and it was good to just talk to one person with you. Yeah, and, um, so, Allie, did you stay in Oak, too? Okay. And what was your experience like in Oak? Um, overall, it was really fun. It was a new experience because I've never stayed in Oak Lodge before. I always stayed in a cabin. And it was just really cool to stay in there. And it was also really nice to get to meet new people and get to talk in the lounge room. Um, and, yeah. Yeah. So um, what's the policy with boys? Are they allowed in there? <gasps> Okay, we'll send you back to church camp then. Get those boys out of Oak Lodge. Um, so tell us a little bit about the schedule for the day as far as what did you do? Like did you have small group time maybe in the mornings and then activity? And if so, tell us about some of your small group, how that worked. The small groups were split up the two boys into two small groups and the two girls into two small groups. We each had a counselor with us in that group, and we each made up names. I was in the classy glasses because we all really liked the class house. And we just did activities in there, and we did the scavenger hunt on the first day, and we had to go find a bunch of activities going on with that day. And normally, whatever the main like day was about, like if it was name calling or something like that, then that's what we would talk about in our small groups. Okay. Um, Allie, why don't you talk to us about your small group? So I was in the SME Smurfs, and um, so we would have like points. So if you did like, if you helped clean up something or you helped somebody out, you would get points. And at the end of the day, they would round up all the points and see who won. And whoever won would get like a secret bag that had like snacks in it or something. And there would be a new winner every day, and I just thought it was really interesting. Yeah, that's, an, that's a pretty interesting system for encouraging everyone to look after one another and help you. Did you ever win? Oh, good. Um, <laughs> great. Talk to us about uh, pool time. That always seems to be a big hit. And uh, how did that work, Macy? Um, it was very different because normally there's this thing called canteen that we have before, and it's like a snack time. But we normally do it after the pool. But this year we did it before, and we had an hour there and 15 to 20 minutes at the pool, which was very interesting. Um, and at the pool, the biggest thing that happened was getting pushed in or pulled in. 
even if you had clothes on. <laughs> wow. It happened a lot. <laughs> Al, you want to talk about the pool time? Um, like Macy said, it was really weird having canteen before the pool, but the first few days, the pool looked really gross because it was like all green. It wasn't blue. <laughs> And then one day we couldn't even go in the pool because the chlorine was so high and it would burn two layers of our skin off. <laughs> so we couldn't go in. But uh, the last two days it looked really good and of course you get pushed in even if you don't want to. Um, so yeah, it was really fun though. Very good. Why don't you talk to us um, a little bit about worship because that's a part of our church camp experience with Trek Camp. Tell us about how that works. Um, so worship is a very nice time after a long day of doing a bunch of activities and just running around and going quiet to just settle down before bed. Um, worship was a very nice time and we each age group got to serve one night and like lead worship, which was very fun. Our night was interesting, um, but I helped out pass out things to everyone and it was really nice. Okay. Allie, why don't you talk to us about your experience? Um, worship was one of my favorite times because after like a long day or a long crazy day, it's like a nice time to just wind down and get ready to like go to sleep. And yeah, we had like different age groups to go each night. And um, I read the scripture and I kept messing up the words, but I just went on with it. And um, yeah. All right, and you know, um, those moments of reading scripture, messing up the words, what a great place to be with your friends and recognize it doesn't have to be perfect to be in worship. Um, so how about, uh, Allie, I'll let you go first, but just uh, a high point of your week, if you had to name one. Um, my high point? I mean, I loved all of it, but my favorite part was definitely getting to make new friends that I never thought I would make. And a lot of them were older than me, but it was really fun to just get to interact with older kids or kids my age because I never met them before. And I also got to see people from last year that are still in the juniors, but it was nice to get to see them again. Yeah, that's true. And Macy, what about you? Um, I definitely did like making friends, but one of my high points is we went on a hike on Thursday. It was burning hot. There was bugs everywhere, and we got lost. <laughs> um, it was very overgrown, so every like break that you got, we'd do a tick, a tick check. It was very hard to say, but and you'd always check yourself for ticks because that's like the biggest thing. And we wrote a letter to ourselves that we'll get next year, and I wrote, "I'm lost" online. <laughs> I'm on a hike, and I'm lost. <laughs> Let's hope a year from now you won't be lost. You'll be found. Um, well, I'm glad you, you both had a really good week. And I also wanted to mention that two of our former uh, and present um, youth that are now graduated from high school were there to be your counselors. Um, so you had um, uh, Ebony Gray and also Kaylee Finley there so that was uh that was nice and, and did you um neither one of you had them as a small group leader or okay but you just you would saw them and they knew you right when you got there yeah so it's nice to know that some of our our youth are also out there serving as counselors would you two like to be counselors some year okay great well that's a wonderful goal and that's a great way to give back and um like always said it's so much fun to meet a new friend and maybe an older friend and uh, I know this morning, Macy mentioned she met a young lady from Virginia Beach Christian Church. And maybe Allie uh, met some youth from different parts of our state. I and mean, that's always exciting, too. So. Well, let's say a word of prayer and thanksgiving for this wonderful week of camp. God, thank you for the directors, the camp counselors, all of them volunteers, all of them giving a week of their time to be part of this wonderful transformative experience and Lord, I, I hope that you would put on our hearts to be a part of camp somehow. Could we volunteer? Could we help to make the camp facility a nicer place for young people? Could we make a donation to support a young person going to camp? So help us, Lord, to be supportive and encouraging to 
Allie and Macy and so many other young people as they are on their journey of faith. And we thank, give you thanks, Lord, that everyone had a good week. And we especially give thanks that Macy got unlost. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for the update. We appreciate the report back, girls. Thank you. Yeah, we should give them a round of applause. Now we're going to get an update from Kay and see where she is in her journey. Hi, kids. Kay here. I am in Reno, Nevada now. That's very far away from Virginia. But I am working on plans to come home to Virginia. Making those plans makes me think about all of the things that I need to get done when I get home. It's a big, long list. I've been looking over this list, and I'm trying to figure out, really, how am I going to get it all done? It made me a little bit worried and a little bit anxious. Has that ever happened to you? You might have a lot of things that you need to get done. Probably when you're in school, you have to think about being in school all day, and then afterwards, maybe there's soccer practice or baseball practice, and then you have to get your homework done too, and there are chores to do around the house, and everybody just seems so busy. And sometimes you might worry about how to get it all done. I wonder what the Bible says about that. You know, there's actually a story in the Bible where this thing happened. There were two sisters, and they were very, very busy. They had a very big, long list of things to do. One of the sisters, she got right busy on it. She started cooking and cleaning and taking care of everything. But she was getting frustrated because her other sister wouldn't help. So she said, hey, sister, are you not going to help me with this? And do you know what that sister did? She just sat there and listened. wonder why she just sat there and listened was because she was listening to Jesus. And she knew that that was the most important thing. Well, the very busy sister, she came right in and she said, Jesus, don't you think she should be helping me? Isn't that the right thing to do is to help me get all of this done? And he said, well, actually, the most important thing is to listen to Jesus and listen to what Jesus has to say about God. Don't worry about all the rest of that stuff. He never really said, don't get the work done. He just said that the most important thing and the thing that should come first is listening to Jesus. How do we do that though in our very busy lives? Well, we do that in a couple of ways. I think the most important way is by praying. Is praying listening? Does praying help us get anything done? It really, really does. I'll tell you what, when you pray, you can tell God, tell Jesus all of the things that are weighing on your heart, all of the things that are keeping your mind too busy, all of the things that you're worried about. You can tell God all about this things to do list. And then you listen. Listen to what God says to you about it. In prayer, you also you can tell them about anybody that you're worried about. Maybe somebody that's sick or sad. You tell God about all of the things that you're happy about. And then you listen to what God has to say about that. You'll feel better after you pray. And then that big, long things to do list will be a little easier to tackle. Another way that we can listen to Jesus is by reading the Bible. Read the stories that are in the Bible and then think about it and listen. That's how we listen to Jesus. It's important to go to church too and listen to other people talk about Jesus and to talk about God. Listen to the sermon. Listen in Sunday school. Just listen. Yeah, that big things to do list, it'll still be there, but it'll be easier after you've taken the time to spend some time with Jesus and with God to pray and to listen. Let's say a prayer about that now. Dear God, thank you for always 
being there for us. Help us to always listen to you. Amen. And until next time. Today's scripture is from Luke 10, 38 through 42. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. This morning I was speaking outside about this passage, and I mentioned a question about that name, Martha. And I asked the congregation outside if anyone knew someone named Martha. And I was sort of surprised how many people raised their hands. Who, who knows a Martha? See, look at that. I must be sheltered. I've only known one Martha. And uh, so maybe I, I kind of am different than, uh, than the rest of you. But um, this Martha who I knew was the wife of a minister I worked with in Kentucky. And his wife, Martha, was really involved in the life and ministry of the church. And I, I worked with Martha for many years. But what I found interesting was Martha always wanted to be referred to as Martha Nell. And Nell was her middle name. And that's fine. You know, that was her prerogative. So I knew it was Martha Nell. Kind of like one word. So we have Sarah Bell, even though it's Sarah Bell. We call her Sarah Bell, uh, which Sarah likes to laugh about that. Um, but anyways, uh, Martha Nell, a uh, friend of, of the church and friend of mine, down the, the journey of, after many years, I found out from the minister, Bob, who I worked with, that his wife, Martha, wanted to be called Martha Nell because she didn't want to be associated with this woman from Scripture, Martha. You know, and it got me thinking a little bit, almost like we sometimes refer to Thomas in Scripture as doubting Thomas, right? So we might think of Martha in ill regard. We might go, well, this is a story about two sisters, and we want to make sure that if we're these two sisters, we want to make sure that we're Mary and we're not Martha. And it, it's easy to polarize stories like this. We, we do that to kind of make it easy maybe for us to remember or recall the story. But I'm going to try and help us to maybe think a little deeper about today's story and maybe some of the complexities of what Luke's talking about. The first thing I want to mention is that this story is not in all four of the Gospels. As a matter of fact, it's only in Luke. And this story that we're preaching from today precedes another story that we talked about last Sunday. And that was the story of the Good Samaritan. And that story is very famous. Everyone knows that story. And we talked about last Sunday the importance of the Samaritan. And what the Samaritan did, obviously, was to stop and give aid to this person who had been beat up and was bleeding by the side of the road. And we're also told in that story that there was two other people who passed by who were religiously affiliated, but those people did not feel the need to stop. Only the good Samaritan stopped. And so sometimes if we wanted to summarize that story, we might say, we had a story last week about a person who stopped, and what did they do? They did something more than nothing, right? I mean, we could, it's a pretty simple summary, and sometimes we might say, well, this person put their faith into action. And, you know, usually as the minister is preaching, that's going to be a pretty recurring theme here in church. Don't just be a person of faith but be a person who puts your faith into action. And that action might look like coming to church. It might look like being a volunteer at church. There's all sorts of ways 
that we can do that, and that would seem to be a pretty logical way of thinking about our journey of faith. The other thing I, I want to say is we're kind of thinking about today's passage, and we're thinking about the story of the Good Samaritan followed immediately in the Gospel of Luke by the story of Mary and Martha is that originally we know that these stories would have been on a scroll and there would have been no paragraphs. There would have been no way of delineating one story from another. Matter of fact, um, a lot of the stories that were written are written in such a manner that you know one paragraph would run right into the next one. So a person could be reading this and they would go right from one story to the next. And I want to kind of mention that because I want to suggest that these two stories, don't they seem to be very contrasting stories? Don't they seem to kind of give us one message here and then a very different message there? And isn't it the case that sometimes in Scripture we can be like, well, what does the Bible want me to do? I'm a little bit confused. And I think that I, I wanted to mention that because I think it's good that we suggest that the Bible is a complex document. And that's sometimes why we come to church, because we want to scratch our heads and go, huh, I'm not so sure, you know, that I know what the, the message is. And I'm just going to say in, in a simple sum, summation, I'm not so sure what the message is today either. I'm going, to, I'm going to kind of be on a journey with you. My observation is that I'm surprised by Jesus. And I like to be surprised by Jesus. I like when I think Jesus should say this, but he says that. Jesus famously in the Bible one time turns to an individual and says, I need you to follow me. And the individual says, I can't. I've got a funeral. My dad just died. And Jesus says to the individual, let the dead bury the dead. I need you to follow me. And we're like, what? Right? And I've, I've kind of preached that. And sometimes we do a Bible study on that with the youth. And they're, they're like me. They're going, wow, Jesus, that doesn't seem like a Jesus answer. Well, guess what? Jesus is going to throw some curveballs at us. And when, he, when Jesus does that, I think he's inviting us into a deeper reflection of this story. So let's just pretend, which is a dangerous thing to do, that Dan is Jesus. That can't be a good idea. But Dan's Jesus, and he's watching this unfold, and he sees Martha. And what she's doing is she's doing what I would call showing hospitality. Right? So she's going to make sure that there's enough food. She's going to make sure there's enough water. She's going to make sure there's a chair for everyone to sit in. And she is doing, going about her activities to make sure that this party has got everything it needs for Jesus to enjoy himself. So Dan is going to say to Martha, well done, good and faithful Martha. But Jesus contrastingly says, Martha, you need to appreciate your sister Mary and Mary in this story is sitting, as Kay identified, and just simply sitting and listening to Jesus. So let's see if we can figure out maybe why Jesus would have erred on the side of Mary and been critical of Martha. And this is going to be, um, going to be the challenge of today's sermon. And it would be wonderful to just hit that pause switch right now and just ask everyone. I would, it would just be great because there would be all kinds of answers. And we might we might um, be able to kind of suggest a lot of different things. Before I even go to the next step in the sermon, let me just ask this question. You're either Mary or you're Martha. Which one are you? And I would say that a lot of us, I, I, I don't know, it'd be an interesting question too, but a lot of us older folks may be Marthas, and a lot of us younger folks may be Marys, okay? And sometimes maybe we're Martha, and we find ourselves at Thanksgiving being the host. And I asked this question in the morning service, but it'd be interesting. How many people host Thanksgiving? You are the host. Okay. How many people attend Thanksgiving just somewhere else? It's a pretty different experience, isn't it? Okay. I'm the guy who shows up for Thanksgiving, and I'm known in the netting household at my parents' house as the whirlwind. I walk in, and I'm not helpful on serving, but I'm very helpful on talking, and I'm very helpful on eating cookies, and I'm very helpful on just hanging around, laughing. So we know there's a big difference between the time you find yourself in a position of serving and when you find yourself in a position of just showing up for an event. So Martha 
does, I think as we're trying to kind of unpack what's happening with Martha, I'm going to give you another illustration that you might find funny and humorous and certainly true to form for who I am. Uh, one of the things that we all know about Dan Netting is his obsession or love for photography. And um, probably anyone who's graced the doors of this sanctuary has uh, at one point been photographed. And you know, someday, maybe when I'm old, there'll be like about 200 lawsuits that will come on my head for not having digital rights for whatever picture I took of someone. Um, but let's hope it doesn't come down to that. I like to take pictures, and I do take pictures, but I identified a long time ago, and you know this too, that in the process of taking a picture, you step out of a moment to capture the moment. Am I right about that? And have we ever seen a situation when we're at that piano recital or when we're at that school play and we see the parent who is carefully videoing the entire event and we're sitting next to them and we're saying, you might do yourself a favor to stop videoing and actually just be in the event. And have we ever seen that? And we wonder ourselves, is that video ever really going to be appreciated as much as you would have just appreciated fully being in the moment right then? So one of the reasons why I still am this old guy using a camera, and people are continuing to say, why are you using your phone? Is first of all, because I've recognized that phones really are very distracting to the moment. We all know people who pick up their phone and maybe they're going to take a picture, but then they also notice they've got, you know, this and that and the other thing going on their phone, and they need, to, um, they need to address those issues. So I'm kind of the guy that's pretty apprehensive to touch my phone because I can see where it might pull me out of the moment. So instead, <laughs> I'm the one who's reaching down for the holster, you know, and pulling out my silly red camera, partially because I know I can take a picture really fast. And so I know that when I take the picture, I can take a snap of picture and maybe step back into the moment and not ruin the moment by trying to document the moment. Well, I think that when we see that, we recognize that sometimes when you're hosting, you can then pull yourself out of an event because you're in the process of hosting that event, just like you can pull yourself out of a moment by trying to take a picture. One of the things that's interesting um, about kitchens is the way that they've changed over time. And I think we would all agree with this. I'm living in a house that's coming up on its 100-year birthday. So I'm very excited about that to see if it can make it. Some of you hopefully are in new homes, which would be wonderful. But my older home, which was built in 1928, out in this, this subdivision far from the epicenter of Salem, uh, out in this lakeside area, when that was way out in the middle of nowhere, uh, the homes that they built on our street uh, were a bungalow style home, and the way that the design of these homes had a kitchen that, in our case of our house, you go down a, a narrow hallway, and then you make a right-hand turn, and there's this little box that's situated in one corner of the house, and that is our kitchen. And I'm not quite sure about who designed our home or what the intention was, but I'm going to speculate in 1927, as they were laying down the plans for this new subdivision, that uh, the individual building this home imagined that there would be a woman in that kitchen making food, and she's going to prepare this food back here in the kitchen while the party is going on in the living room. Now, if, uh, and I could be so, uh, I could be incorrect about that assumption, but I'm just going to lean into that assumption. So here's, uh, you know, this woman cooking, here's this party, and here's Martha, right? She's coming into the party, serving, back to the kitchen, back and forth. And so I think we have kind of seen an evolution in the way people design homes now. And we've noticed that kitchens are uh, moving out of that back corner of the home and they're moving into what we call an open design kitchen. And in an open design kitchen, we start to notice that the kitchen's moving more and more into the middle of the house. And it's having fewer and fewer walls around it. And all of a sudden, we're noticing that uh, the person who's cooking 
is not only cooking uh, in the kitchen, but the kitchen is now the living room. And matter of fact, no one's in the living room anymore because everyone's where? They're in the kitchen. We're all in the kitchen now, okay? And so while uh, Martha is making food or hosting an event, everyone is hanging around in the kitchen. Now, I, I think that that makes perfect sense because I know in our home, when we have friends or other people over, everyone still does that in our home. And, and the kitchen is very tiny. So we're all packed in our kitchen, standing around. Uh, you can't even move anymore, but it's, it's a party, okay? It's wonderful to have everyone in that room together. So today in today's story, Martha is segregated from the party, and she's angry about that. And what happens is she at some point does what you don't want to do, and she lapses from a position of being the host and showing hospitality. She just makes this one little twist and this one little turn, and we've all made this little turn. And the word that I use for this little turn is when you go from hosting to the point where you then become a little bit and a lot of bit bitter. Has anyone ever been bitter? Maybe you're bitter right now that you're here in church listening to me. Bitter is an interesting thing that happens when, and it doesn't usually happen in the, in the moment for me, it happens later on. I find myself brushing my teeth and I'm reviewing the day and I'm thinking to myself, I'm bitter. And the bitterness comes from people who give too much. Do you think Martha today gave too much? Well, apparently she did because she complained to Jesus that Jesus was supposed to complain to someone else. And Jesus said, I'm not going to do that. Martha, if you're going to choose to serve dinner, then you need to serve dinner as a host and with an understanding of what you're doing. One of the songs that we used to sing at church camp, we don't sing it anymore, but we should. Uh, it was a song that said, God loves a cheerful giver. Does anyone remember that song from Camp Days? And I remember as a kid, you're just like, well, God loves a cheerful giver. As a kid, what you, what you interpreted that is that God loves someone who gives. But as an adult, when you hear that song, you go, no, God loves a what? And God does not love a what? You see that? That's what you hear as an adult. God loves a cheerful giver. God does not love a person who is giving with frustration, anger, and resentment, which then results in bitterness, then results in this sense of, I'm not going to do that again, right? And don't we live in a world where we go to people and say, I need your help. We're going to try and host a yard sale. I need some people to come in and volunteer to price these items. And the person says, I, I don't want to give too much, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to participate in the yard sale. I'm not going to participate in the you know, the day, the work day. I'm not going to participate. I don't want to get bitter. I'm afraid of bitterness. So to solve bitterness, I'm not going to give. Well, guess what? If we don't give, we don't have a church anymore. So the solution to preventing your bitterness is not to say, I'm not going to do. I'm going to just not be Martha. I'm going to be Mary. I'm just going to sit and listen to Jesus. Hey, someone's got to make dinner. So I don't think that that's the solution, though that's the solution a lot of people choose. I think the solution that we need to look to today as people of faith is this solution. Be a cheerful giver. Choose to give and give fully and understand what you're doing. Don't try and be a person who's the host and giving and at the same time sitting and listening to Jesus. You chose and you give as the host. And because you are giving as the host, you are providing an opportunity for Mary and Jesus and a whole lot of people to learn. We do this all the time in church. We provide environments where people can come and have a Sunday school class or have some other opportunity for learning. So we need to make sure that when we give, we do it with intentionality. The Good Samaritan does not finish the story by saying, you know what, I should not have paid for the inn. You know what, I should not have stopped and helped this individual because it cost me a half hour of my time or a day of wages. The Good Samaritan is famous because, best we know, the Good Samaritan gave and gave freely and gave with thanksgiving. 
So I think we want to walk away from today's message. And, and I appreciate what Kay said. I, I really do. I think she's right. We need to be people who are, take the time to listen, for sure. But I think we also need to recognize that there's a place for all of us to be Martha's, and there's a place for us to serve. And the Bible certainly is telling us that we need to put our faith in action in acts of service. But I think that today's message is that we also need to take the time to recognize that when we give too much, then we become angry and bitter. And what good are we if we're angry? So we need to give as we are able. We need to listen so that we have insight as to when we need to pull back. And then we need to make sure that if we find ourselves in a position of saying, well, I'm angry, I'm bitter, I'm mad, I'm frustrated, that we need to then do exactly what anyone of faith does, which is to say, God, what's the bigger picture? Was my service in this event merited? Even though I didn't listen to Jesus, others were able. So God, use your glory. My time for listening will come. Today was my day to be a servant, to serve. And I think if we can have that sense, we won't find ourselves bitter and angry, and certainly we'll be in a position of wanting to serve Christ in all that we do. Amen. Amen. As we come to the table, let's remind ourselves that it's a metaphor, and the metaphor is a place where everyone is welcome which is a metaphor for a church where we show hospitality and welcoming to everyone. Every Sunday as we come, we recommit ourselves to the ministry of hospitality that all are welcome at this table. Let's commune together. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for this time at your holy table. Let us open our hearts to you and your love. As we partake in communion, help us think not about our work and our tasks, but of your son, Jesus. Let us give thanks for his sacrifice and our salvation. Amen. Before I pray, I'd like to say a few words. Um, my brother has asked me to thank you uh, and this church for all the prayers for his first grandson, Cyrus. He is very healthy today. He is out of the ICU, um, and he's doing well. And that's uh, this church. You guys had a lot to do with that. Thank you so much. Please pray with me. God, thank you so much for this wonderful day to gather around this table uh, and enjoy the meal that you have brought to us with the sacrifice of your son. God, please let us remember the importance of this meal and the importance of prayer in our lives. In your name we pray, amen.
These words from scripture, if you'd like to join with me. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it and blessed it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, these words. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Offertory video this morning is a sad video. It's kind of a disturbing, but it is also, I think, important for us to recognize that, you know, there's things in our lives that are really important, and sometimes we don't realize how important they are until they aren't in our lives. And sometimes we assume things will just always be there, and they're not. So um, as we kind of strive together to make church what it needs to be for these young people, for these older members, for all of us, we have to work together. And we've got to be committed to our church. Otherwise, uh, church can go away. Uh, we have been talking a lot recently about our offering because we are having a hard time financially right now as a church. And so I do want to encourage everyone to um, be vigilant in your support as uh, we continue to move through these summer months. Yeah. 
come forward and our hymn invitation, I have decided to follow Jesus. God, thank you so much for this beautiful day and the weather, and please um, please remind us that this week to put down our phones and live fully in the moment, because that's what you want us to do. Amen. Amen. The Spirit Song, as we close.